So hello everybody to my talk. First of all, I hope everyone had a good lunch. Got to see a stomach full. So who has posted a picture of their food? Who has ever posted a picture of their food? Okay, you're not going to admit that. <laughs> Let's ask it that way. Who is not on Facebook or Instagram? I know that, yeah, thank you very much. So before you fall asleep because of the food, let like get a little bit the activity up because we are at the Hacker Conference. We are talking about all kinds of fun stuff. So please cheer up because you're going to hear a mind-blowing presentation right now. This presentation is going all about be about competition and this presentation is going to talk about the real threats of life, the real dangers you have to face. This presentation is going to take over all your minds, it will take over your thoughts and this uh, is a selfie. Um, I'm Mark Winkovich, working as a security engineer at LogMain. So this is the slide people usually talk about themselves. But I don't want to tell too much, but a little disclaimer for the talk. First of all, as I stand here right now, I'm a prophet. If you would search Google for prophet at this instant, it would drop pictures of me. It's true, I'm going to give you words of wisdom, I'm going to give you truth and its raw beauty. So sit back, accept everything I'm telling you unconditionally. But remember, if you go home and it doesn't work, don't blame me, I'm just a prophet. I'm giving no guarantees here. So as a prophet, what I'm saying is the world is not going to end. Well, I don't know if you heard it at this conference or you heard it at other conferences. You're going to hear it, security is broken. Everything is lost, you cannot do anything. End of the world. But well, I'm telling you that's not the case and I'm going to give you a solution. I'm going to give you a solution to happiness, to a better marriage, to your car consuming less. And what I'm going to tell you, it's not magic. So it's very simple, everyone can do it. So if you have no scar on your forehead or the force is not strong within you, don't worry, this talk is exactly for you. But if you are the kind of security engineer who always says no and it cannot be done, well, Harry Potter is going to take you away. So let's talk about strap modeling. And before we start playing cards, because I know that's what everybody came from for, let's first discuss what strap modeling is, how you should do it, what the purpose of it is, and why strat modeling is like unit testing or playing taxes, no one does it. But before we go into strat modeling, first let's go and find out what a strat is, because a lot of trouble already begins with the misinterpretation of this word. Now, when I was searching the internet for what a strat is, this is the picture I found. It seems all really nice, like, right? Crocodiles are the strat. You are the asset, your balance is the vulnerability. Now, if you think about it, if a crocodile would be a threat, the word threat modeling would be something like this. Okay, this is not what threat modeling is about. So I'm going to give you a more proper definition of what a threat is from the European Network and Information Security Agency, which says a threat is any circumstance or event, and I'd like to add person here, with the potential to adversely impact an asset through unauthorized access, destruction, disclosure, modification of data, and or denial of service. Now I can't give you a picture as nice as the one with the crocodiles, but I'm going to give you the picture that OVAS provides here. I'm going to guide you through this picture what it is all about. Now first of all, a threat starts with a threat agent. There is always a threat agent. So the crocodiles in the picture, that would have been a threat agent. Now threat agent modeling would have made sense then. And also, a threat always impacts an asset. More importantly, it impacts something with a business impact. So me drinking all this espresso or eating all your peanuts at the booth, that's hopefully not a threat because it doesn't have a business impact for you. And finally, a threat always goes through some kind of weakness, through some kind of attack. So when you get an attack which tries to adversely affect your system, then you are really talking about a threat. So to summarize, a threat is not something like a ubiquitous entity. It's not the NSA which is the threat. A threat is something very specific you can action on, you can deal with it, you can do something about it. Okay. Now, if I discuss threat, let's also discuss what modeling should be about. Now modeling with the words of Norman Dost should consider three main things, which are the target audience, the purpose, and the scope. Well, I'm going to go through this from the bottom because it's easier to explain it that way. 
So what is the scope of threat modeling? Well, obviously, the scope of threat modeling should be your system or your software or something like that. So that's easy. What's the purpose of threat modeling? Well, the purpose of threat modeling should be to make your system more secure. Now, let's stop here, because a lot of people don't do threat modeling to make their system more secure, but rather to generate a report or create paper planes or whatever. So whenever you had the purpose of things that I just mentioned with threat modeling, Harry Potter is going to take you away. So please, if you are doing threat modeling, always think about how can I make the system more secure by doing the threat modeling. And finally, target audience. Now, with the target audience, it's important that, as Martin said, you consider your target audience. You know who is going to read this, what he can do about this, and how we can deal with it. So just handing out a report by itself is not going to help anything. As a matter of fact, if you're doing it that way, your target audience probably looks something like this. Now, you can recognize if you reach your target audience. You can recognize it by words saying, I didn't get it, it landed in my spam filter. Uh, sorry, I have a new mail agent, I don't know how it works. Or the, my favorite is, I have a new laptop, I haven't got mail on it yet. So if you hear any of these sentences, you know you reach your target audience. Now, if you ever heard this sentence before, I beg you, never do threat modeling again. Because if you reach your target audience like this, you really started an epic battle. You started the epic battle between security and development. Now, as I've been on both sides, I'm allowed to talk about this epic battle. Obviously, Mortal Kombat is much better, so I'm on the better side of it, but that's not the point. But let's start with what security engineers think of this battle. Security engineers are always complaining that they didn't get a proper description of the system. They're complaining that the system they are testing is not up to date. The documentation is not appropriate. They say the engineers don't know what the system should be actually doing. They say the description is too fuzzy. They say it's raining, I'm hangover, whatever. So they are going to complain why they cannot provide you a proper job. Now, also looking on the other side, what do developers think of the security engineers? They're going to say when they receive a report that they can't do anything about with this. It's, it doesn't make sense. It will say, well, this report has been created with a version we had two months ago, so it's irrelevant by now. Or they're going to look at it and say, well, I don't un even understand the threats which are described here. They are irrelevant. It's nothing I could do about this. It's not a a development task to deal with this. It's something completely out of my scope. So, sorry, but have you looked at this picture? Who is that guy? Like, everyone is happy in that picture. He's like, oh my God, help me. I think he's showing, I've been kidnapped. This is the second dress I have to wear. <laughs> now let's keep with this poor guy. So let's say he's our developer, he's Ken. So when we think about our target audience, when we think about our average developer, what are the things we should assume? Well, a developer is a good technician. He knows his technology. He knows his, the system he's working with. Probably he is quite proficient in it. And he's going to understand plain technical English. Now, this is something security engineers don't consider. They think developers are not going to understand me. They're speaking the same language as you are if you try to. And most importantly, developers are proud of their craftsmanship. They're proud of what they're doing. They're proud of what they are delivering. And they want to provide good software. If you give them the circumstances and the possibilities, they're going to deal with the important stuff. If you are working with them and telling them how to make something even better, they're absolutely happy to work with you if you let them and if you are cooperating with them. Now, having gone through the different uh, aspects of modeling, let's finally go into threat modeling via an example. Now, I have to stop here. This is the only slide I have with bullet points. I'm really sorry about it. I had no idea how to present this in a different way. If you ask me, I'm completely against bullet points. If there was a petition against bullet points, I would 
sign it immediately. I saw a, a headline just the last time. It said something, murder by bullet points, or something like that. So, but let's go through this slide. What are the steps of threat modeling? First of all, you have to identify your objectives, survey your application and decompose it, and then you identify, document, and create the threats. Now let's, something missing here. Anyway, so um, if you think again about your target audience, is he going to understand this? Well, this is quite clear at this moment, right? There's nothing fancy about these steps. So your developers specifically can, can work with this. Now I said we are going to do threat modeling via an example. So the example is going to be a damn vulnerable web shop. Now, what I'd like you to do when we talk about this damn vulnerable web shop is that you imagine all kinds of functionality you know from a web shop and think it is in there, okay? So if you saw anything in a web shop and you think it's relevant, let's assume this functionality is in this example. But if we quickly survey what our damn vulnerable web shop consists of, it consists of a website. Obviously, the website has an integrated admin functionality. It will have a backend server where all the logic is running. The server is going to have a configuration with the production keys, with the connection strings, with the keys to external services. You're going to have a database with a product, and you're going to have a mail server where you can uh, send out announcements or updates, uh, send shipping information, but you can also receive orders by hand via the mail server, which then the employees are going to put into the database. Now, the uh, second step of our threat modeling was, whoa, okay, sorry. This text uh, should be saying, uh, what was the initial one? Yeah, and so what are your assets? Your assets are, well, you want to protect your infra infrastructure, obviously. You want to protect your customer data, hopefully. You have some privileged employee accounts in your system, and you want to protect the reputation of your company. Now the question is, is this understandable for a target audience? Again, there's nothing difficult about this. So if you explain this to a developer, you should be fine dealing with this. Okay, so the next steps of the threat modeling was to survey your applica application and decompose it. Now I already presented a high level diagram of this, but what we usually do is draw a data flow diagram of the system. Now, when I'm doing this step, I usually involve the developers. So we sit together with the developers and talk about the system, draw this diagram together, and identify what's happening. Why a data flow diagram is really good for this purpose is because there you can identify the trust boundary of your system, and you can say what kind of data is leaving your system and what kind of data is coming in. Again, does the developer understand this? Obviously understands it. I would also emphasize involve your developers into doing this because my experience was when I involved senior developers and was working with them about drawing up the diagram, most of developers were like, poo, this is how our system works? Well, he didn't say poo, but he really didn't know how the system works until he saw the diagram of it. Now, for the next steps, I'm going to divide this talk into two parts. So we are going to talk about the classical approach of threat modeling, and now I'm going to talk about the gamified approach to threat modeling. So enter the stage, classical approach to threat modeling. So I'm going to go through these last three steps, which are identify your threats, document them, and rate them, Specifically, now only talking about the classical approach. Now, the first time my boss came to me and said, well, could you do threat modeling with this team? I was like, yeah, sure, it's easy, isn't it? So I've heard about it, I've learned about it, so I thought, I'll just, just do some literature research, and then I'm going to find all the details about the magic, how to do it, what is the best methodology, how to identify the really important threats, how to rate the risks of these items. Now, as it turns out, what's out there regarding methodology for threat modeling, it's really disappointing. So you actually are going to get no real help into doing it. But let me show you some examples. So as I was searching the literature, 
This was the first piece of advice that I came across. It says, bring members of the development and test teams together to conduct an informed brainstorming session in front of a whiteboard. Now, I don't know how you are with this. I have no clue what an informed brainstorming should be. I've never heard of something as an informed brainstorming, but it must be something if there is a whiteboard it gets informed or something. Okay, so this didn't help, so I moved on to the next piece, which said, you get a set of experienced experts in a room, give them a way to take notes, and let them go. The quality of the brainstorm is bound by the experience of the brainstormers and the amount of time spent. Now, really, it's experience and time spent. That's what's going to define your threat model. Good, so the question is, how much time? What, how much time do I need for a good strap model? Well, everybody's going to tell, it depends how complex the system is, how good your experts are, how many threats you want to identify. Okay, this is not helping. There must be some more specific information how much time I need. So I read this line over and over, and I realized it actually gives you a hint about it. It tells you, you have to let them go. So put your security engineers in a room, ask them to provide a good threat model, and that's it. They're gone. You'll never see them again. <laughs> you have to let them go. Well, this is something which is making me sad, advice like this. So let's try to move on. There must be something good out there, right? So I started looking at all kinds of lecture, lectures and YouTube videos. So one guy said, the sole process that you are going to go through is what are all the different types of attacks that could make sense for the threat agent to get to the assets. So reading this, it says, go through all the different types of attacks. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the common weakness enumeration. It contains 1,000 items. If you go through all the permutations of threat agent and asset, and 1,000 types of attacks, that's not a thought process. If, if you try to do that as a thought, you're going to explode. So quickly, let's move on to the next one, which just says, most security professionals can just think and know what bad outcomes there are. Right? That's all you have to do. You just think and know everything. So next time this guy comes along as a security engineer, you should hire him, because he can just think and know of all the outcomes there are. Now, if this is the advice we can give on methodology, I don't know what we expect in the next steps, but let's try. So, documenting and rating the threats, the report is usually going to look something like this. Now, I would like to ask, to take a moment and take this report in. So it's very well written, right? It talks about threats, it talks about effort and impact and possible controls. So this is something you can give to your developers that they should work with this, right? No way. If you give this to a developer, he's going to kill you. He's going to use those two fingers and cause you agony. He's going to cause you pain and death. Really, if you look at some of the sentences here, okay, I know this is an example I took, for a vote, took for a vote from a water system, but look at the sentences. It says, Water ballot selections are access of election information system by individuals with authorized access to these machines resulting in a loss of water private. What? I don't even understand that sentence. And if I understood it, what could I do about this? It's completely irrelevant. There's nothing you can do with this. It's just telling you what you shouldn't do. It's telling you what the problem can be. Now, if we take this example and try to apply it to a different field, let's apply it to architecture. If I'm telling architects what could go wrong? This is what you get. The car may get stolen on the ground floor, or the overhead cables may tear down, or I don't even know what's bad here. I don't know, guests might be insulted by the word straight or something like that. So if you're doing threat modeling like this, if you're just telling people what could go wrong, what they shouldn't do, again, Please stop doing it. You're just harming. You're just starting the epic battle. Search for a different job, please. So let's talk about the gamified approach to this. Again, going through these three steps. So for the first step, it says identify threats. 
for which you can use the game Cornucopia and Elevation of Privilege. So these two games are quite similar. Cornucopia has a better, more focused approach to web applications, while Elevation of Privilege tries to be a little bit more generic, discussing a wider class of attacks. And as a matter of fact, these games really work like a card game. So what you do is you get your developers, senior engineers, your security engineer in one room, and you're going to hand out the cards in a round. So then you play in a round, always playing one color at a time. So everyone has to play the specified color. And the person with the highest card in the round is going to get a point. So that's quite easy. The addition to it is that each card contains a description of a threat. So when you're playing the card, you try to apply that threat to your system. You try to identify some specific threat in your system that could be exploited. And if you uh, succeed in finding something, you'll get a point for that. So in the end, you will have someone with the most points, so there's also some kind of reward then for the winner or some kind of motivation to participate in this game. So let's look at details and how a card looks. A card has a suit. The suit is different classes of attacks or uh, threats. So the suits are authentication, authorization, uh, data validation, cryptography, session management, and then you've got an overall class which is cornucopia. Then the card is going to have a rank. So the higher the rank is, the more severe the threat will be to your system. Also, this is going to define like who won the round of the game. And the most important part of the card is the description of the threat. So every time someone plays a card, he's reading this threat aloud, and he's trying to apply this threat to the specified system they are investigating. Now, if there are any questions about what this threat is or what to do about it, there are also a number of references on the card, like to the OWASP secure coding practices or the application security verification standard or the common attack pattern enumeration. So if you've got troubles and what to do about it, there's also a lot of additional material you could look into. Does Ken understand this? Yeah, of course he can understand it. It's absolutely natural English language with a lot of addition if he has any problems. It's a simple game he just has to participate in, and it's going to use all the experience and knowledge he has about it. So what we are going to do next, we're going to play a game. So some of you received cards when they came in. So we are going to use our damn vulnerable web shop to try out how it works to apply the threats from the cards to this system. So let me recap what we are going to do. We are going to go one suit by a time. So we are going to start with the suit authentication. Everyone who has a card with authentication on it should read whether they find how this threat could be applied to the system. And then you put your hands up, um, you're going to read aloud the description of the threat, and we're going to look how to apply that threat to this system. And when we are finished with authentication, we're going to move on. So the point is to play the highest rank card in the given suit. So if you start by playing the four of authentication, the next person should try to play something higher, like the eighth or the jack of authentication. So first of all, who has an authentication card in their hand? Please, hands up. There must be more than that, I know. <laughs> okay, so please have a look at your authentication card. Read the thread you find on it. And remember, this is a typical web shop which is damn vulnerable, so probably I would say rather certainly that threat you have in your hand is going to apply to the system. So take a minute, check the threat on your card, and if you find where your card could be applied to the system, raise your hand, and we are going to look it up. Uh, could we have some lights for the audience so they can read their cards? Thank you. So again, we are playing authentication. So anyone who can apply an authentication card in their hand, please raise your hand. I take my notes so I know what cards you have. 
Well, you can think of problems like finding out usernames in the system, right? That's something you shouldn't be able to find out. How could you find the usernames in the system? Sorry. Um, yeah, you can read, but uh, you're also going to get a mic for a moment. So say the rank of the card. The rank is four. Yeah. Uh, Sebastian can easily identify usernames or can enumerate them. Yes, exactly. How could Sebastian identify usernames in this system? So as I said, it's a typical web application. How do you usually find usernames in a system? Yes. Yeah, th those are great examples, but this is a damn vulnerable web shop. You don't need to go that far. You can find all the usernames in the customer reviews. You can find the usernames by trying to register and it telling you, well, this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Ah, okay, so the recording can hear it. Do you want me to say that again? <laughs> <laughs> no, let, let's move on. We've, we've got a limited time. So next card. So we had four of authentication. Any higher card in authentication? There you go. Um, the rank is seven. Yeah. Uh, Cecilia can use brute force and dictionary attacks against one of our many accounts without limit. All these attacks are simplified due to insufficient complexity, length, expiration, and reuse requirements for passwords. Great. So how could you apply this? Where, where would you try to brute force passwords here? Uh, in the third party login. Uh, yeah, part. third party login, or you could use a simple login form because there are no captchas. There is no throttling on the endpoint, nothing like that. OK, so anyone with a higher card in authentication? No? OK, so let's move on. Seven of authentication one. Next, let's go through authorization. So authorization cards. Who has authorization cards? Let me see it. Yeah. OK, so try to apply the thread on your card to this system. And if you can, please put up your hand so we can go there with the mic. Well, authorization, ah, okay, there. Uh, you get a mic, one moment. So the rank is uh, Jack. Okay. Uh, Dennis can access security configuration information or access control list. Okay, so where would this happen? Um, actually, Dennis can uh, access the logs and delete these things and... Exactly, so if you look at the diagram, so that's why it's important to have a data flow diagram. Uh, I don't have a, have a mouse, oh great. So here you see that employees can actually access the web configuration. So they are going to be able to access all the server configuration and all the information like logs and whatever, which you probably shouldn't do. Okay, so, uh, well, that was already the highest card in authorization, so let's move on to data validation. Ah, okay, the Joker card. Yes, you can play the Joker card at any moment. That's, that's your privilege. One moment, you get the mic. Okay, so I also realized that uh, the employee can uh, access the database, and uh, it may be uh, a big issue. Yeah, exactly. So you should limit the access to your database, because we said that there are manual product requests or orders, which the employees are going to write into the database manually. So that's something you shouldn't do. You should limit who has access to the database, and most of your stuff shouldn't have access to it. So great attack. Thank you. 
Anything in data validation? There you go. All right, I got a king, which says, Gabe can inject data in the server-side interpreter, SQL, OS commands, XPath, server-side JavaScript, SMTP, because a strongly tied parameterized interface is not being used or has not been implemented correctly. I would start by the login form. Yeah, here. logging or, or simply SQL injections by the user anywhere. field, password field, whatever. All right, and it's yeah. a king. Make note of that. Yeah, it's a king. So it was already the highest card. So we've got cryptography. Anyone cryptography guard? There you go. I think I've got the lowest uh, free of cryptography. Axel can modify transient or permanent data store or stored or in transit or source code or updates, patches, or configuration data because it is not subject to integrity checking. Okay, why would that happen here? Well, I think basically can do it anywhere, but one interesting point is I think updates or patches, so you can actually work with the code so, so the web shop does something different. So yeah. for example, it doesn't, it, it logs orders for someone else or modifies the payments to zero so you can buy stuff for free. Exactly, yeah. So something which is often neglected are malicious employees, insider threats. So if you have code updates or web configuration of database updates via your internal employees, you also have to put some controls in there. You have to ensure that someone is not just inserting some malicious code in your system because you say you trust all your developers. Well, bad news is 80% of the attacks happen by insider threats, okay? So you should consider that. So cryptography? Anyone else? Oh, you, had, you already had the joker, come on. <laughs> uh, there in the... Yeah, it's a J. Okay. Justin can read credentials for accessing internal or external resources, services and other systems because they are stored in an unencrypted format or saved in the source code. So where would this happen here? Well, uh, obviously one of your employees can read the source code, but I hope you're not that dumb. So you can still be dumb enough to put it in configuration and the database and then, then well, you could stop doing it, probably. Exactly, so please hash your passwords, okay? Even more, don't use SHA, yeah. That's yeah. the interesting wrong thing to say, Mark. You would never use a hash as a regular table type of hash. You want to use either bcrypt, scrypt, or pbkdf2, which are adaptive algorithms. Exactly. Never tell developers to use hash for passwords. Exactly, I just, if you let my sentence be complete, I would say don't use SHA for it, but use scrypt. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so um, quickly before we run out of time, cornucopia. Let's play one cornucopia card. Who has a cornucopia card? So you unfortunately have to play it. <coughs> so this is rank number four. Uh, Keith can perform an action and it's not possible to attribute it to him. Yeah, so where would you do this? Uh, I'll let you tell you, the, you are oh. the expert. <laughs> okay, thank you. So again, as I said, consider insider threats. So if employees are allowed to do privilege um, actions on your system, that's okay. But have an audit log of it. Have a trace of what kinds of events did happen, who did it. So if anything goes wrong, have a chance to look up where it came from. If you cannot stop the attack anymore, at least be able to find out where it came from, okay? So thank you very much for participating in the game. Uh, let's go on because I only have five minutes left. So normally what you would do is, during playing the game, when someone applies the threat to the system, then take notes. In a note, you would write down which card this was, you would write down who played the card, so you can count scores at the end, and you would have notes about the specific description, what the threat was, where it happened, what the cause is, and so on. Now, what I like to do, 
and let's bring Cam back in the picture. What I like to do is to have a developer do all these nodes. Why? Because I usually don't know the names of all the people in the room. He does. But apart from that, I can be sure that when he's taking notes, he's going to write something down he's going to understand. He's going to write something down that based on his system knowledge and his technolo technological knowledge, he can apply, he can understand it. So later on when the developers are looking at it, they're going to understand what the threat is about. It's not going to be me formalizing some strange text. So the next step would be rating your threats. So what I usually do here is after we had the discussion or the game, have the developers put up all the issues they've written into their usual ticket ticking system and then invite them into a meeting where I usually like to have in the product owner, like to have some senior engineer or development owner in there and some of the senior developers. So not everyone has to be in this uh, meeting. And what we are going to do now, there, and why it's important to have these people at one table, is because then you can really assess the risk of the individual items. It's not going to be you as an outsider saying, well, this is a severe issue because it has a high probability, perhaps, don't know. But if you have these people in there, the product owner can tell you how many customers do you have, how important is this feature. It might be some really simple thing but if you have important customers using that feature, it's going to get a high-risk item. Also, you're going to have the developers there, so they are going to tell you how difficult it is to exploit that threat or not. So will can uh, work with this? Well, of course he can, because you are putting all the information in his usual ticketing system. You're putting the information into his usual workflow, so when he's leaving that meeting, he already has a prioritized list of backlog items he can immediately pick up. He has a description of the specific item he should be working on, and if he doesn't know what to do about it, you've met him so many times that by now he's going to come to you and he's going to talk to you, and you're also going to understand what happened because you were involved in the whole process. You know what they were talking about. So, summarizing, we compared the classical approach to threat modeling to the gamified approach. But the question is, what have we learned? So we learned this is not threat modeling. We've learned that classical security engineers have no methodology. They work absolutely ad hoc. You get no insight, so better get someone from the X-Men team to do it. You learned that security engineers are constantly battling against developers. They're constantly bashing them what they did wrong. But this actually is not going to cause any kind of improvement to the security. And classical threat modeling is going to end up with buildings like this. So classical threat modeling can be applied to everything, and it's going to work with everything, but it's as good as using a hammer with a screw. You can do it. It's going to cause a lot of damage, but by the end, you're going to have the screw in the wall, right? So compared to this, the gamified approach is going to bring everyone together. Everyone is going to get to know each other, raise awareness in the developers, in the security engineers, and have someone strip by the end of the meeting. You are going to have items which are obvious, which can be worked on by our developers, which are actionable. But as a final note, take care that you don't go too much into details because you have just specified cards and developers like to go into details. So sometimes you have to make a step back and try to apply a little broader view but that's all a little trade-off you have to make. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and bye.